our second guest, Adam, Adam Caruso. Well, uh, uh, he is coming from, uh, let's say, uh, closer to home place, at the same time and a little bit further, because uh, uh, he's a Canadian, he studied at uh, McGill University, and I know that uh, in the public there are a lot of people that know him, and they share some of his uh, student time at McGill University. His office, uh, Adam Caruso and uh, Caruso St. John, has been founded in London in the 1990s, and uh, he has been and is one of the most interesting uh, British uh, architectural office. In addition to the professional work, Adam is also, has also been teaching in different places and uh, University of North London for 10 years, I think. Mendrisio, Architectural uh, Academy in Mendrisio at the beginning when it was founded and Harvard GSD and uh, at uh, the ETA Federal Polytechnic in Zurich in the last year. Hello. <coughs> Is it on or? <coughs> Almost everything. <coughs> we were talking before about Islamic architecture and I must say we've looked at quite different aspects of it. I mean, it was very interesting what you were talking about with the Aga Khan Award, which I'm familiar with and which is an amazing program. But actually, we just went with our students to the south of Spain to look at 11th and 12th century Islamic architecture in Europe. Um, I guess that was our attempt at kind of a cross-pollinization of cultures, which nowadays are described, uh, you know, the political narrative is that they're totally, from our point of view, the Islamic culture is the other, but actually if you look at um, the tradition of Moorish Spain, the Moorish south of Europe, they were absolutely one culture, and when uh, Islam was ejected from Spain, the only craftsmen around were still the Islamic craftsmen and architects, and they just continued to build for the Catholic royal family in Spain. Um, I guess I'm going to talk more about form. Um, but form, uh, in terms of what it can mean, and, and almost everything, uh, what that means, what that's about is, I want to talk about how in our practice we use form, and, and what it means to us, and where the form comes from. And just to, to contextualize, the, the, the subject of this is about what's urgent now, or what could be in the next few years. Um, we've obviously seen a fairly dramatic economic uh, events in the last 18 months. I think you felt them in Canada. In Britain, we felt them really were on the front edge. It's been very brutal because Britain had all four, uh, was enmeshed in all four uh, of the worst economic activities you could be in in order to experience the crash at its maximum uh, power. Uh, and we're feeling it. Not our practice, luckily, but the city and the country are feeling it in a very dramatic way. <clears throat> uh, in my more optimistic moments, I hope that this crisis uh, uh, means that this period of late capitalism, uh, laissez-faire confidence in the markets, is finished and we're going to move forward to another uh, economic and political model. I'm a f I'm, I fear we're not, because I fear many of the strategies being put forward, um, these interventionist strategies, although they're the right thing to do, I think they're actually being put into place just to rebuild the old structures. Architecture in the last 10 or 15 years has exactly tracked this laissez-faire, late capitalism. Um, you could say maybe architecture has always done that, or building has always done that. I think what's special about this last period is that art architects or famous architects have, in an unprecedented way, legitimized this architecture which tracks and which serves the market. And uh, his name was mentioned before, Rem Kulas. In a way, Rem Kulas has been the arch-legitimizer 
of the market as a generator for architecture. Um, I'm quite confident that that architecture is finished. I think it's run its course. It has no more artistic energy, and I, I, I think those architects are also going to run out of energy. Um, and so what I'd like to speculate on is a model, and I think we're in a complex world, so there are many models, but a model which might come to the fore now in Europe, maybe more than here, but I only know about practicing in Europe. Um, and I guess I would say this, but it's sort of the path that Peter and I have been following for almost 20 years. I mean, developing. It's not a path that we would have identified when we started, but maybe it's become more and more clear and articulated in our work in the last 10 years. Um, and that's this idea of almost everything. I'm interested in using almost everything to make our architecture as long as it comes from the body of architecture. I'm an architect who makes form, uh, who makes environments that are hopefully respond to their situation, and their situation is a physical situation, it's also a social situation. I'm not a politician. I'm interested in politics, and sometimes I think maybe I should do that instead. But as long as I'm doing architecture, I'm interested in form and the materialization of form. I said I'm going to talk about a European architecture, but I'm actually going to start in Chicago. Uh, I'm increasingly fascinated with what happened in Chicago in the second half of the 19th century. And I would say, and the reason I'm fascinated by it is because it was a particularly fruitful uh, development of the culture of architecture within a very fast changing economic uh, and admittedly quite brutal uh, market-oriented economic uh, situation. Actually, many of the ideas that were uh, being introduced in Chicago at that time came very directly from Europe. Sixty percent of architects in the second half of the 19th century in Chicago could read German. Forty percent were from Germany or their parents were from Germany. Semper almost took a professorship up in Chicago. He was way late in London where he thought he'd get a better job, but he didn't. Uh, and that's why he had his tickets to go to Chicago. So in a way that you do not see in England, for instance, where Semper is totally unknown, in Chicago at this time, the uh, Semper's theory of, of der Stiel, of how you make an architecture, which is one of the most amazing theories. It, it's, it's like... Uh, you know, Semper was doing what Darwin and von Humboldt were doing in the natural sciences. He was really trying to understand how the whole of human endeavor in cultural terms uh, could inform a contemporary artistic production. So these people knew about this. This is, of course, Marshall Field's warehouse by Richardson, who went to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, and maybe it's not such a Semperian example, but it's a uh, 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 French Renaissance, uh, a, a French Romanesque uh, kind of formal language brought to the gridiron block of Chicago. And for me, it's the Ur modern commercial building. Yeah, he's taken, say, that it, it, I, it's French uh, Romantic, or it's actually, it could be an Italian palazzo, a kind of building which would normally have three stories and through an incredible artistic transformation, he's managed to make a 10-story uh, warehouse building. But one still can see the, the source, the European source, and one can also appreciate the incredible artistic invention required to achieve this transformation. And this building became really the model for what happened uh, for the next 30 years in Chicago and then in other at North American cities that were growing on grid iron plans at that time. One of my favorite buildings in the world, uh, the auditorium building by Sullivan and Adler. Um, it was the largest building in the world when it was completed. It was the tallest building in the world when it was completed. This photograph doesn't show the tower, but um, 
It was built in three years. It was a highly commercial venture. Uh, they almost went bankrupt, the people who built it, but they hung on and they ended up making loads of money through this building. It had a hybrid program. It has a 3,000 seat concert hall, well, concert opera hall. It has a hotel. It has a grand uh, restaurant above the entrances. It has offices. It had Adler and Sullivan's office in the tower. And this is another transformation. Uh, it's full of invention. The idea of putting all of those things in one building required enormous technical innovation, uh, which Adler largely took care of. But it also required enormous formal invention, because this is, you can see it's already, it, it's, it's considerably more complex than Marshall Fields, which already was a more complex iteration of the European model. But you can still see the original typology within it. The other thing I really love about this photograph, this is South Michigan Avenue looking at the rail yards along the lake shore. And we often use this image in competition entries because for me, it's absolutely an urban facade, a, a city wall, and yet not that many things are common about the buildings. There's no consistent baseline. There's no consistent cornice line. The buildings actually have different kinds of windows. But there is enough in common. There's a kind of consensus about trabiation and about, yes, we're developing a European tradition, a, a, a tradition of architecture that comes from pre and post Renaissance Europe. There's enough of a kind of respect for that culture that there's a continuity and there's a coherence. Because for me, in these days, the only urban plan in Chicago was the grid. I think nowadays we're lucky if we could even agree a grid, you know. But I think every building, and obviously the bigger the building is, the more effect it has, every building has the capacity and it also has the responsibility to at least attempt this kind of continuity. Attempt to find where, through its form, it can... Uh, it can articulate some kind of consensus. Because, I mean, architecture, and it's not a conscious thing, but unconsciously it's somehow expressing society, you know, not like a politician, but through its forms. And the only kind of, I mean, I'm very interested in being part of society, but a kind of society where I have something in common with the people on the bus next to me, or the people, you know, who are sitting next to me at a restaurant, or or who I pass in the street. And architecture, it's the same. You have to, you do have to, it's like a social contract, isn't it? You do have to buy into those things or else you have a kind of nihilism, which is actually what the last 15 years of urban building has been more about. And then we get to the kind of, the apotheosis of these buildings. It's not actually in Chicago, it's in Buffalo. We took our Harvard students to see this building. None of them were aware of, its, uh, of it having existed. And it was a shocking thing to see this building, shocking in an amazing way. The fineness of it, the way in which Sullivan, the incredible uh, invention of surface ornament, but this decision to use terracotta, which previously had been a fireproofing material, which was hidden in the building, the idea that if he had to fireproof the frame. Why not use this fireproofing to articulate, to, to give a culture to the diagram of the structure, which is what he was doing. The difference that it, using a cast and fired material like terracotta uh, made as opposed to using carved stone because the joints between the tiles become part of the identity of the facade. But the shocking thing when we went to visit was how orange it was. It also felt like a 13-story pile of clay. And it had this, this visceral material uh, presence as well, which reminded me of, of, of uh, a Joseph Boyce environment. And that was a shock. And it, it was something like yet another level of amazingness about this building. And of course, you know, really great buildings have much more than what the architects put into them. That's why they can 
they can persist. Okay, I've done Chicago now. So I'm going to go to Europe now. Um, and just to show four interiors by Adolf Loos, which I think show the kind of... Uh, Adolf Loos is one of my, another one of my favorite architects. Uh, he was also maybe one of the best writing architects ever. His writing was witty and concise and brutally caustic. Uh, but also very important, and I think it still has a lot of relevance. And the work that he did in these interiors in Vienna, which I'm showing, uh, one might not be in Vienna, um, is the incredible precision that his architecture had vis-a-vis uh, -vis the atmosphere of the space he was making. The way the formal decisions and the ambience of these interiors reflected social mores at that time, but sometimes also gave a little twist and challenged social mores, although as often as not just articulated them. So this is Museum Café, one of his first interiors in, in, in Vienna, which has been recently restored. And this is a classic Viennese café. It's a place you can go for breakfast at 7 in the morning. You can go for a beer at, and a schnitzel at 10 or 11 in the evening. Nowadays, it's quite family-friendly. We went to Christmas with our son, and you feel quite comfortable hanging out, reading newspapers, doing whatever, and it has a kind of shifting clientele over the day. Two years later, he did this interior, the American Bar, which has also been restored, and which is a bit of a tourist spot now. But even today, it's so small, it's so dark, it's clearly a space where you drink whiskey and you smoke cigarettes. And although children are allowed in because it's Vienna, it doesn't really feel like a place for children. It's a place to drink whiskey. And my Viennese friends tell me at two in the morning, it returns to being a real bar and not so much a tourist spot. I mean, it's only a tourist spot for 12 people because that's all it fits in. <laughs> this is not, this is uh, the Villa Villa Muller in, in Prague, which is Loess's, probably his greatest house. And this is the living room at the center of this incredible developed round plan. Um, and what I love about this space, it's a representational space. It's a space a bit like the house that you showed at the end, second to, second to last project. It's a big house, so it's representational. It has rooms which have a quasi-public atmosphere. But what Loess was doing, he was juxtaposing in a brutal way, really, private rooms. And so the boudoir for the uh, women guests is glimpsed through these openings up one stair. The smoking room might be on the other side. So the whole uh, bourgeois uh, private family structure is not hidden away like it would be in an English country house, which is the model for this set of rooms, but rather it's exposed in a kind of more, yeah, in a kind of more fractured, kind of proto-modernist way, in a kind of more Freudian way, which I guess is of the time. And then to end on a very Freudian image, the, uh, uh, the bedroom of Loos's flat on Beethovenstrasse, where he lived for 30 years in this two-room apartment, uh, and yeah, a fur bedroom, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> everyone's dream, and he lived the dream of the fur bedroom. <laughs> yeah. He was a funny guy. Witty, witty, not, not strange too, but very witty. I'm going too slow. Um, I was going to show four images of uh, projects by Leverance, uh, Sigurd Leverance, who um, yeah, is a, another hero. And just to show how themes of displacement and distillation and, and distillation to a point where things are almost disappearing is common to Leverance's work in his classical work. This is the Resurrection Chapel at the Woodland Cemetery. Just to show you the interior where you have bas-relief Doric pilasters, which if they were any more bas-relief would be invisible. So, and you know the stories that Leverance used to sketch in 7H pencil, you know, and so these are 7H <laughs> pilasters. And, but the, the degree of compression 
means that they are pilasters, but they lose the continuity with the other pilasters. So they become like banners or like strips on the wall. And he's doing the same thing with this window console on the other side. It's a correct window console, but again, it's so attenuated and squeezed that it becomes this element which is on its own, but the balance between all of these strange elements makes a whole and a space. And that's what I think is very special about Leverance. It isn't a fetishizing of individual parts. It's a kind of intensification of the individual parts, but in order to make a single atmosphere. St. Peter's Church in Klippan, uh, which is a bit too heavy even for me, uh, but where he uses these bricks with the wide mortar joints, a kind of syntax of architecture which requires him to invent all sorts of strange details in terms of how you make an opening in a wall for a window, for a doorway, in order to allow the heat in. Uh, but in the end, it's not about the individual details, it's about the constellation which blur together to make a very strong place. And the flower kiosk, one of his last projects in Malmo. I, I have to go quicker. And finally, uh, the work of uh, conceptual artists in the late 60s, which at the beginning of our practice was a huge source of uh, inspiration. We used to crib these projects uh, shamelessly. And I just wanted to show one. This is uh, Gordon Matta Clark's Walls Papers from 1973, where this was a time when there was a lot of uh, um, demolition in downtown New York. A lot of artists were making work about this. Hans Hake was also making work about how three people owned all of these, these slum landlords who owned all of this, uh, this real estate and they were demolishing in order to increase property values. And, but what's beautiful about this project is Matt Clark took a series of these photographs. We've all seen this and we've all been, I think, attracted to the picturesque, romantic qualities of this exposure of the, of the party wall, the parts of the building which never are meant to be exposed to the city being exposed by the removal of its neighbor. So the bits of wallpaper peeling on the wall, all that's missing, the, the, the chimney places, all that's missing is the bathtub hanging on the pipes. But then what he does with this, it's, it's, he's, he's making a critique, but he's also trying to make something, turn it into something absolutely constructive. So then he isolated these elements showing the wallpaper in the party wall. And then from those he did screen prints with these amazing soft uh, colors. And then the screen prints were joined together and installed in 112 Green Street to make new wallpaper in this loft building, which was a building exactly like the building that he'd photographed. And so he takes this piece of, which in other artists' hands, like in the hands of someone like Hans Hake, was a piece of political commentary, and he actually transforms it formally to take a kind of reality and ameliorate it, and to show how even that unpromising reality could be turned into something positive. And I think that's what architects should be doing. And that's the big problem I have, say, with Rem Kulas. He's a brilliant observer, but he just observes and observes and observes. And he doesn't actually try to ameliorate, I don't think. He does, actually, but he never, he doesn't admit it. He doesn't want to admit that that's a concern of his. OK, I'm going to show four projects very quickly that relate specifically to those references. That's how I've chosen them. This is an early project, which has been demolished. It was a very, uh, very modest warehouse, which was a wallpaper uh, warehouse. And it didn't have a facade. It was bricked in. And we wanted to make a project which engaged with the dereliction of these muse kind of sites in London, especially this was the early 90s, the last big recession. I got, it was my house. I got it for very cheap, the site. Uh, and, but which ameliorated the situation, which allowed it to become a studio and then a house, but also ameliorated in a way which levered the existing decrepitude into a kind of picturesque composition. So the idea of making this facade, uh, which is clamped onto the section of the building, which is all that was there. The idea of adding new elements in 
a taped and jointed plasterboard left bare so that it would they would have an equivalence with the wire brushed, really crappy render and brickwork that was there in the building. So that together they make really a whole, not an old and a new part. Looking up at this space, which is very inspired by Matta Clark cuts and things like uh, Baroque Orange and, and projects like that. And then from the back, you know, which is our project? You can hardly tell. It looks practically architecture free, despite the number of drawings that had to be done to do that. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> That's the skill, obviously. <laughs> That's the old, old days. I mean, lately we're trying to be a bit grander. I guess we're more experienced and we're learning how to deal with classicism and Gothic architecture, higher architecture. We're off, also, obviously, doing more public buildings and public buildings can't be fragile like that previous project. So this is a part of a, a, a long-term project at the Museum of Childhood, which is part of the Victorian Albert Museum, where we had to make an entrance and a new forecourt for this building, which was built in the 1870s, which was meant to have an entrance pavilions, but they ran out of money, so they never built them. So what that meant is we had to demolish a little lean-to structure to have the toilets on the front. It's a historic monument that took a lot of negotiation. And then make a new building, which somehow in its color and in the language of its architecture has, has a connection to the existing building. The existing building, the facades were done by J.W. Wilde, who was the brother-in-law of Owen Jones, who was an expert in early Renaissance architecture. And the colors and these patterns are coming from Venetian early Renaissance architecture, these illusionistic patterns. But then, of course, the way we make them, it's all water cut and laser cut stone and it's like a piece of marquetry so there's no relief although actually in those Venetian churches there's no relief either in a building like um, Santa Maria dei Miracoli it's also very flat the facades and then on the inside continuing the outside is red the inside is green that is correct Victorian color theory um, making this foyer and then the inside of the building which has this incredible proprietary cast iron structure and yeah I won't go on about it. This house that we did in West London which was finished a couple of years ago which was our homage to Leverence so it's a house in the center of a block which has we would have loved to do a Georgian house but this site didn't allow it this building doesn't have facades it has no conventional relationships to the morphology of the city so we had to make a house that had a strong internal presence and we made an early decision to make the house out of brick and again to almost not cut the bricks which made us invent all sorts of perverse things in order to achieve that. And indeed it does have a very strong presence because it's made of brick. The brick is load-bearing um, so because there's no views, because there aren't, there's no garden because we don't have all of those things, we have, to, we have to provide alternatives. But a big discussion between Peter and I was how much should it be like a chapel and how much should it be like a church because we're making it be like a house. And that was about the light levels. It was to do with the complexity of the spatial arrangement. And in the end, it feels like a house. It doesn't feel like a church to do with the colors of the bricks. And that's a very careful judgment. And it's you don't know until you've done it, actually, because in the end, the building is a little bit brighter than we thought it would be, but all sorts of other things which we weren't aware of normalize it, I suppose. This is a building that's almost finished, finally. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's called Nottingham Contemporary. It's a Kunsthalle in Nottingham where we've, for the first time, managed, we've done many competitions, managed to build our version of Sullivan. It's in the lace market in Nottingham. Nottingham was an innovator in the 19th century of making mechanically produced lace, which put the French and Flemish lace makers out of business. And we're in the area which was making mechanical lace. We found a pattern of lace, you'll see in a moment. 
and we did a year-long research project about how to transfer this lace at a correct scale, not at a Warhol distorted scale, in order to make these precast facades. We're not getting it carved in wood by a craftsman and made in, in, in terracotta. That would be hopelessly romantic to do in 2009. We're using current technologies. We're using 14 meter long precast elements. Um, and yeah, there was a long process of computer modeling, then computer milling, then making rubber formworks, and then the formworks being used to make the precast elements. And you can see the fineness of these elements is beyond what we'd hoped, it, beyond any of the prototypes that we did during the process. And because it's precast, the tolerances are not like stone. You have 17 millimeter precast um, tolerances, and therefore the panels have an aluminium capping piece so that we, can, we cover the gaps. So the thing retains its precision and its fineness and doesn't kind of leak into the world of motorway infrastructure. And the final thing is uh, just to end on something beautiful. Uh, an exhibition that we spent two years designing for Tate Britain, where we're doing lots of much bigger things, but this was a pleasure uh, to, to exhibit neo English neoclassical sculpture in the Duveens. The Tate has all of the equivalent paintings to these pieces, but they don't have any of the statues. And the curators, when they were putting the show together, thought, well, the Duveens would be the perfect place to show them. They have this classical... Um, classical architecture, and they have lots of natural light. And as you can see, we excluded all of the natural light, and that took about a year of discussions with some of the curators, because the point of the matter is that these statues are not life-sized. They're about 80% life-sized. They're very, very delicate and small. They have this magnificent surface, marble surface, you know, which has a translucence because of the material. And actually, when they were displayed in English country houses, they were displayed in rooms with candlelight, often. And actually, it was about a very specific light source, not the very generalized light source of top light, which the Duveens have. So we did lots of experiments and lots of convincing of some of the curators, not the Tate curators were on board from the beginning. And we excluded all of the light in the Duveens, and we used extremely focused spots in order to make this drama, because otherwise you wouldn't have noticed the sculptures. This is the main space at Tate Britain, which regularly gets 4,000 people a day. You wouldn't have seen the sculptures if they weren't made more present with the light. So this is in the oct central octagon, this collection of busts. Another discussion we had, we said, conventionally they should be at this height, and we said, no, they have to be higher. They should be like the ancestors looking down on us, but also if we don't put them higher, nobody's going to see them. And then the last room has these pieces in repose, and it culminates in the Three Graces, which is up on a high altar at the end of the axis. That's it. Thanks.